So without further ado, you did not come to hear me, you came to hear Scott. I would love to introduce you all to Scott Benning. He is a professor and atmospheric scientist from Colorado State University. Scott has spoken to both climate change believers and climate change deniers alike. Um, and he has served on advisory panels for NASA, for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, for the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation, so he knows what he's talking about. Um, without further ado, Scott. Thanks. Thank Thanks a lot for, uh, for having me and for coming out. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. So I have three things to talk about this evening, um, all about climate change, and I call it the three S's. Um, the three S's of climate change are simple, serious, and solvable. So um, you may not think about simple when, when you think about climate change, but I'm, I'm here to sort of tell you that the science of climate change is science that you learned in grade school. Um, you, you don't have to get you know, rocket science kind of degrees to, to do that stuff. Um, it's stuff that everybody understands and, and you just sort of need to be reminded of it. So simple is how it works, serious is why it's bad, and solvable is what are you gonna do about it. Um, I've been working on this for like 30 years and um, you might ask, you know, if it's so simple, how come I still have a job? Um, but but uh, I, I am gonna sort of explain to you what I mean by simple. Serious, nobody really wants to talk about that. I mean, it's the part that, that you've, I'm sure you've heard it before, but there's really kind of no avoiding it. We have to talk about, about the fact that this is a serious problem. It's a problem that will get more and more and more serious until we stop making it worse. And then it won't get better for a really long time. So uh, we, we really kind of have to wrestle with that, but nobody likes to end on that because that's just demoralizing and, and depressing. Um, so we sort of sandwich that, that middle S um, before solvable, and I promise that we will get to solutions. We never do this uh, without um, finishing up with, with solutions. So regarding simple, um, do you ever wonder why day is warmer than night? Or why summer is warmer than winter? Or why Phoenix is warmer than Fargo? If you think about it for just a sec, you'll realize you actually know the answer to those questions, right? You, you know why these things are true. And in all three cases, the answer is the same. It's because when we add heat to things, they change their temperature, right? This is, this is not that hard to understand. Um, another way I put it is um, heat in minus heat out equals change of heat, right? So um, I just got here, so I'm not sure what your weather has been like, um, but you know, at least where I live in Fort Collins, um, we had some snow last week, it was really cold, now it's really warm. Um, the weather changes a lot from day to day. Now that is not climate change, that's weather. And weather is all about heat coming in and out the sides, right? The air that was here one day blows away you know, to Kansas or something, and other air blows in from upstream and replaces that air, and it's a different temperature, it's a different you know, moisture content and so forth. That's why the weather changes day to day. It's, it's mostly because of stuff flowing in and out the sides. But when we look at the Earth as a whole, there are no sides. The world is round, and on the round Earth, you can't change the amount of heat by moving stuff around sideways. All that does is rearrange the heat you've already got. The only way that the Earth can exchange heat with the rest of the universe is through the top. You're not used to thinking of the Earth as having a top, but there is one. It's the top of the atmosphere. And all of the energy coming in and out of the Earth has to go through the top of the atmosphere. Now, somewhere in the dim past, you learned that there are three ways to move heat around. Uh, I'll start you off, it's conduction, Convection, you know the other one? Radiation, very good. So some of you like, you know, you learned this stuff in like sixth grade or something. Um, so there's no conduction to outer space because it's a vacuum out there. You can't conduct to a vacuum. Convection is like when the hot air rises from a campfire and you can't convect the heat out to space because of gravity, right? Gravity holds the air down, thank goodness, on, on the ground and that's why we can breathe. Um, so you can't, can't get rid of heat that way. The heat that comes in from the sun, if that was the whole story, that's just heat in, right? Heat in minus heat out equals change of heat. If the sunshine was the only, the only thing going, the earth would get hotter and hotter and hotter forever until it like melted 
or boiled or vaporized, be the end of the world. So thank goodness that's not the whole story. The heat has to get out, but it can't con conduct or convect. It has to radiate out. Now, the, the thing that's hard, the reason why people have a hard time with this, is you can't see the outgoing heat radiation. It's there. I guarantee it's there. It's, you know it's there because I just told you otherwise, you know, the Earth would boil. Um, but you also know it's there. I know it's there because you can measure it. You can literally just measure the, the heat radiation. If I had been a little more organized, I have an infrared, uh, infrared video camera in my office. And I often will uh, put it on Wi-Fi mode and like pan it across the audience. You can actually see yourselves radiating heat in the infrared, right? You can, like this gentleman in front, you're going to radiate like crazy, except for your glasses are going to be cold and they're not going to radiate as much. It's fun to do this with students. They, they eat it up. Um, so just like you radiate heat, the Earth radiates heat to space. And it's infrared, so the, the photons are too wimpy to tickle a little retina at the back of your eye. You can't see that heat, but that heat has to radiate out. Unlike the sunshine, which we can see, it's, it's invisible heat radiation. Now, all the heat that radiates out has to go through the air. And the air is made of molecules. Now, you can't see molecules either. If you don't believe in molecules, I don't know, ask your pharmacist or something. But uh, molecules are these little invisible particles, and 99% of the molecules in the air are just these two kinds of molecules, two kinds of gas in our air, oxygen and nitrogen. And they're both what we call diatomic gases. It means there's two atoms of the same element, and they're glommed together with shared electrons. You know, again, I'm sort of reminding you of stuff from high school. Uh, those are chemical bonds. So there's three shared electron things with the nitrogen and two with the oxygen. Um, now, the electromagnetic radiation that's going out is it's waves of electric fields and magnetic fields. And, and electrons, these shared electrons that bond the nitrogen and oxygen together, negatively charged. And a magnetic field can go like sw slosh them back and forth. So it actually kind of vibrates the molecule like woo, 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 woo. It doesn't really make that sound. I just make that part up. But the, the woo-woo-woo molecule, we call that an excited molecule, and that molecule has, has converted some of the electromagnetic radiation that's going up into the vibrational energy of the molecule. But because 99% of the molecules in the air are just these two kinds, then they're perfectly the same on either end, that's it. That's the only way they can wiggle. That's the only way you can change the geometry of an oxygen or nitrogen molecule. There are two other gases in the air that have three atoms instead of two atoms. That top one is called carbon dioxide, and the second one is called water. And they're, there's together less than 1% of the molecules in the atmosphere are, are like this. Uh, by far, the most abundant gases in the air that are not uh, two atom molecules are these two. Now, just like O2 and N2, you can take a, I only got the two hands, so it's carbon dioxide, okay? And uh, along comes a photon of outgoing radiation cooling the Earth, and it can grab onto those electrons and go, whoa, 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 back to its ground state. But, but there's more. Because it's got three atoms, it can go, each one of these different ways of wiggling that molecule absorbs a slightly different wavelength of infrared energy, a slightly different energy level of photon. And that's what makes CO2 a greenhouse gas. We say it has a rich absorption spectrum in the infrared part of the, of the uh, radiation spectrum. Water vapor is even better. It's got this bend. It can kind of do this thing and this thing. This thing, even handsprings, not going to try that here. But you can imagine all the different ways you can rearrange the geometry of these molecules. So, so these gases are, are not greenhouse gases because of greed or capitalism or Al Gore. They, they are greenhouse gases because they got three atoms instead of two atoms. It, it's really just bad luck that the gas that's produced when we burn carbon, carbon dioxide, has this geometry to it where it can interact with the electromagnetic radiation and trap the radiation and re-radiate it back down to Earth. Now, you've all seen a cartoon like this, right? The sun's beating down on the ground, and that's heat in, that warms the ground. Some of it reflects off to space, but the part that doesn't reflect off to space gets absorbed, and that, that's what keeps us warm. Then we gotta get rid of all that heat by radiating out to space, out to these red arrows, but only a little bit of that radiation escapes, gets past all those CO2 molecules, 
and the rest of it gets trapped in the air and then re-radiated in all directions. And if you took this infrared camera that I have at work and you went outside, like let's say at night, right? Uh, there's no sun at night, but I can measure the infrared radiation coming down from the sky. And if you did that everywhere on Earth, now I haven't personally done this, but I believe people that have reported these numbers, if you add up all the infrared radiation coming down from the sky, it's actually almost twice as much as we get from the sun. So this is a huge big deal to the climate system. Without that extra heat that we get 24 seven from the warm sky, this world would not be habitable. We would, we would be an ice ball, like you know the ice planet Hoth in Star Trek or Star Wars. Anyway, uh, the greenhouse effect is, is absolutely central to the habitability of the earth. So it brings me to what I call the common sense explanation of global warming. Many of you are old enough to remember this. this is, these are incandescent light bulbs. And uh, in fact, that one in particular is a four watt light bulb. You remember these things we used to, you know, back when I was a boy, they were, they were Christmas tree lights. And then by the time my kids were little, we used them for night lights in the hallway so they could find the bathroom. So four watt light bulb, if you double the number of these bee boo bee boo molecules up in the sky, it would add that much extra heat to every square meter of the world. So like each one of these chairs is about a half a square meter. And you could imagine for every two chairs having one of these little four watt night light bulbs. And like there'd be one there and there and there and there and there. But it wouldn't just be this room. And it wouldn't just be Colorado. It'd be the whole world covered with little four watt light bulbs every three feet. And you're going to leave those light bulbs on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, forever. And if you did that, the world would be a little bit warmer. Now, it wouldn't be a whole lot warmer because there are only four watt light bulbs, but there's a boatload of them. There's light bulbs everywhere, and you're just going to leave them on for the rest of your life. Now, that's really the nut of global warming. Adding heat to things causes them to change their temperature. And believe it or not, this whole story that I just told you was known before light bulbs were invented. This whole quantitative story about CO2 absorbing infrared radiation, blah, 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 was, was discovered in 1863, 160 years ago. This guy, John Tyndall, put CO2 in glass flasks and shined infrared light through it and measured how much the infrared light was absorbed by the CO2. And he put all different amounts of CO2 and measured how much extra you know, infrared is absorbed. And um, you know, it's been 160 years. In, in all that time, the measurements have gotten better and better and better. We haven't just done them in labs. We've done them outside. We've done them on towers. We've done them on balloons. We've done them from airplanes. We've done them from satellites. And everybody who does these measurements gets exactly the same answer. So I am not making this stuff up. This is, this is really how, uh, how climate change works. So uh, common myth number one, the thing that almost everybody suffers from this misconception about climate change, the myth is the reason why scientists expect a warmer future is because it's been warming up recently. And it has. It has been warming up recently. You know, everybody knows this. Um, but this is not how we figured out global warming. Okay, People, you think, you know, scientists noticed it was getting hot, and they also noticed the CO2 was going up, and they were correlated, and they said, well, it must be the CO2. No. We, we know that adding CO2 warms the climate because we know that when you add heat to things, they change their temperature. And this is you know, formally called the first law of thermodynamics, but you gotta be some sort of egotistical Victorian Brit to call something that simple the first law of thermodynamics. I mean, for God's sakes, cavemen knew this, that, that, that when you put the mammoth on the fire, it gets hot. But they didn't call it the first law of thermodynamics. They said the law of ugh hot. So, so this, is, this is fundamentally why we're so sure that adding CO2 to the air warms the climate. So that's the simple part of this story. And now we gotta talk about how serious it is. And I, you know, kinda of hate to do it because I um, kinda of got you all warmed up and you're, you're laughing and you're being happy and now I'm gonna bum you out with this stuff about how serious climate change is, but there's, there's really kinda of no way around it. You gotta talk about it uh, because it is, it's deadly serious. It's a, it's a problem that left unchecked will become the most serious problem in the world. In any other problem you can name, this, this will be worse than that if you don't do something about it because it just gets worse and worse and worse until you stop making it get worse. 
This is how much global warming there's been up to now, since the year 1900. And the colors show you know, something like one degree Celsius. That's another problem with uh, science, is that we talk in Celsius and everybody else talks in Fahrenheit. So you gotta kind of multiply by two to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit degrees are uh, about half as big as Celsius degrees. Um, most of the world's warmed up about one degree. You can see maybe a little bit more warming on the land than on the oceans, because the oceans are real deep. They have this huge heat capacity. It's hard to warm up the oceans. But there really hasn't been that much warming, about one C of warming up to now. And here's the amount of warming by the end of the century in a world where we get really serious about turning off the coal, oil, and gas, and a world where we don't. So there's the map of how much warming up to, up to now, you, you can hold on to that amount of warming. We, this, this is not that different, right? By the end of the century, about the same amount of warming, we've had a little bit more, particularly up in the Arctic. Um, or we can inhabit this kind of hellscape of, of future warming that's dramatically different than the amount of warming we've had. Basically, you ain't seen nothing yet, except, you know, Another piece of bad news, mo most of the people in this room will not live to 2100. I mean, it's kind of a, we all have this existential problem, but, um, but, but there will still be people around, probably people you know, and you do not want them to be saddled with that. One of the hardest problems here is that, so, so these two worlds, this one with uh, serious climate action and this one without, are averaged on this graph here. So that black line shows all the global warming up to now, not very much. Then the blue line shows what happens if we get real serious about, about uh, stopping this problem. And the red line shows what happens if we don't get real serious. And you can, it's not gonna stop in 2100 either. You can see that red line's still going up faster and faster by 2100. The trouble is that to, a, to, to make the world follow that blue line instead of that red line. We have to do something right now. But the two lines don't really diverge for the next 20 years or so. So you, you gotta like put in the hard effort, do the heavy lifting now in order to avoid that eventuality, you know, like generations from now, uh, even though it doesn't really pay much dividend right, right away. So this is kind of a big problem um, sociologically or politically. So how much warmer are we talking? Um, here's a a low emissions, medium emissions, high emissions world uh, for later in the century in degrees Celsius. And uh, one of the things you might have heard is, uh, says fellow was asking me earlier, this guy uh, writes for your local newspaper was asking me, is this like three degrees, right? Three degrees Fahrenheit worldwide. Um, first of all, there's Celsius, not Fahrenheit, right? The Celsius degrees are bigger. But the other thing you should look at is that the, the maps are not all the same color. You know, obviously the biggest thing that changes the color is the more stuff you burn, the hotter it gets, but, but there's more than that. Um, the, the land warms up way more than the oceans, right? The oceans, you guys don't live by the ocean, but the, uh, well, even people who live by the ocean probably not aware, oceans on the average are um, 13,000 feet deep, very deep, and it covers three quarters of the world. And the uh, heat capacity, the, the amount of thermal inertia of 13,000 feet of water, just phenomenal. It's really hard to change the temperature of 13,000 feet of water. You remember those little four watt light bulbs? It's not gonna change the temperature of 13,000 feet of water that much. So the land warms up way more than the oceans, and if the world is gonna warm up three Celsius, the land is gonna warm up way more than three Celsius because the oceans aren't gonna warm up very much. The next thing you might notice is that the northern hemisphere warms up way more than the southern hemisphere, and that's because the northern hemisphere is mostly land, and the southern hemisphere is mostly ocean. And then the third thing you might notice is that the really snowy, icy places warm up way more than any place else. And that's because snow and ice reflects sun back to space. And if you warm up enough to melt the snow, then you're soaking up extra sunshine. So it's not just the four watts that you get from the extra CO2, it's also the extra absorbed sunshine. So if you know anybody who lives on land in the Northern Hemisphere where it snows, bummer. Right? You, you get extra. You don't get global warming. You get like global warming and a half because of where you live. And of course, that is exactly where we live. And if you look at the middle of North America, with the low emissions world, it's about three degrees. With the high emissions world, it's about six degrees. Oh, but wait, those are Celsius degrees. So six degrees Celsius, actually about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So 
10 degrees Fahrenheit, actually that's starting to sound like more, right? Uh, three degrees didn't sound too bad, but, but I'm telling you, uh, without serious action, we're, we're looking at more like 10 degrees Fahrenheit around here. Um, even that doesn't sound too bad. I mean, it was like 36 degrees outside. If it was 46, I'd probably be fine with that. But we're not just talking about this afternoon. We're talking about on the average 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. This is a map of high temperatures in the United States in Fahrenheit, and each color on the map is five degrees warmer Fahrenheit than the, than the color before it. So there's a Denver dot and a Washington DC dot and so forth. And I'm, if I'm gonna imagine what 10 degrees Fahrenheit of warming, I'm gonna move each dot two colors on the map. And holy mackerel, that's far. 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it's like moving Denver to Albuquerque. It's like moving, you know, Illinois to Mississippi or Washington DC to Florida. This is, this is like moving a thousand miles south. It, it's a huge big deal. If you were a farmer in Eastern Colorado or a rancher in, in the, on a Western slope and you swapped out the climate of Albuquerque for the climate of, of like Lyman, Colorado, those, those guys would notice. They would totally notice. Or Illinois farmers moving to Mississippi. I guarantee you they, they would not have the same kind of livelihood in, in a world that's that much warmer. Now around here, we don't think about going north and south, we think about going up and down, right? Uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit is about the same as 3,000 vertical feet. Now you guys live at like 9,600 feet, so uh, 3,000 vertical feet is like Vail becomes Denver, okay? The, the, climb, the, the temperature, average temperature of Vail would be, if you warmed it 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it'd be about the average temperature of Denver. Or more local around here, think of the temperature up at the top of the ski lift being now the temperature in downtown Breckenridge. So, so that is profound. Um, now at the end of the last ice age, so about 18,000 years ago, this is exactly what happened here in the West, was the, the sort of, you know, montane forest moved up and the ponderosa moved up and the tree line moved up and everything moved up. But it took, it took 10,000 years for that warming at the end of the last ice age to occur. All those, all those zones moving up uh, moved up over a hundred centuries. So that's like a hundred lifetimes of a pine tree, right? The, the seeds are planted here or they, they scatter here and they grow a tree and that scatters seeds and it grows a tree. And, but, but we're talking about doing it not in 100 centuries, but in one century. That same kind of amount of warming as it happened in, in 100 centuries at the end of the Ice Age happened in like basically in you know, two human lifetimes. Amazing. And it's not like Lord of the Rings where the trees just get up and you know, walk up the mountain. You, you change the climate out from under the, the vegetation, it can't adapt. And what you get is fire and, and you know, wholesale replacement of the forest with something else something that you may not even be so, so happy to see in your backyard. Um, we happen to live in a place that's really very sensitive to climate because of the water, right? We live in the semi-arid environment. This is a map of the western U.S. Uh, and the colors show the average annual precipitation. And sure enough, most of it's brown, just like in real life, right? If you drive from here to California, most of the land is brown. Um, but amazingly, we support 75 million people in the area that's covered by this map. And the way that we do that is because of those blue places on the map. You know what those blue places are called? Mountains. And the mountains stick way the heck up in the sky, and the water vapor that blows past gets turned into snowpack. And the snowpack is basically our water supply. Yeah, you know, you got Denver and the Front Range down there. Where do they get their water? They get it from here. The, the water runs down every spring like clockwork and fills up the reservoirs. And then we you know, suck it out of the reservoirs and use that to water our farms and our yards and our golf courses and everything else. Um, if, if you change the climate of here to the climate of Denver, what do you think is gonna happen to that snow? It, it, it ain't gonna be pretty. Um, Bill Ritter used to be our governor told me Scott, Colorado will be the last best place for skiing uh, because our mountains are taller. And the ski resorts will be bankrupt in Vermont and California. Uh, and here, all you'll have to do is, is move the hotels and, and you know, lift lines halfway up the mountain. Um, that's kind of grim. And it's not just grim for skiing, it's, it's grim for everybody who uses the water that, that comes down from the mountains. Um, this is actually data for Colorado statewide snowpack, uh, about 50 years worth of statewide snowpack, 
And, you know, we've only had about two degrees Fahrenheit of warming up to now. And the snowpack, on average, is about 20% less than it was 50 years ago here in Colorado. And of course, there's an awful lot of year-to-year -year variation. You know, 2012 was an epic snow, or 2011 was an epic snow year, 2012 was a killer drought. Um, but on the average, we've lost about 20% of our snowpack with two degrees Fahrenheit of warming. And you could do the math. If you do 10 more degrees Fahrenheit of warming, what does that do to your, to your snowpack? It, it, it ain't good. Worse than that, it's not just about water supply, it's about water demand. And in fact, when we climate people talk about drought, we're not just talking about a lack of precipitation, it's actually just like heat in minus heat out equals change of heat, water in minus water out equals change of water. And a drought is the running, is, well, you count it by, by adding up the water in, the rainfall, snowfall, and subtracting out the water that evaporates off that you use. And if that number goes, goes negative, if you, if you use more than you, than you gain over a period of time, that, that's a drought, formally. And so even if you didn't change the total amount of rain and snow, if you increase the evaporation, you, you wind up with more drought. And of course, that's exactly what happens. If you, if you swap out you know, Denver for Albuquerque and, and uh, Vail for Denver, um, the amount of water that evaporates that, that's dried up out of the forest every year gets more and more and more, and farms need more, and cities need more, and golf courses need more, reservoirs need more. So not only do you sort of crimp the supply, but you also expand the demand. And you know, here in Colorado, they're hoping to, to have um, something like 50% more people by 2050. I, I don't know how that works, honestly. You know, you, you put 8 million people in Colorado and evaporate all the water and melt all the snow. What the heck? How, how does that even work? Um, this is kind of hard to explain, but I'll give it a shot. These are tree rings. This is uh, a thousand years of tree rings from the Central Plains and from the desert southwest. And you can see some weird periods like this back in the 12th and 13th centuries, the medieval mega droughts that did in the Anasazi down in the southwest. Um, a little closer to home, there's the Dust Bowl in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and then these, these colored lines are, are models for uh, drought in the 21st century. And you can see that unless something changes, um, the, the droughts that are yet to come are worse than anything this, this uh, region has seen in, in at least a thousand years, probably much more than that. So kind of grim. Um, the other thing is fire. Um, warmer air evaporates more water. Anybody who's ever watered the lawn knows that. Um, and so our forests get this tremendous you know, slug of water, mud season, this time of year when the snow melts, uh, fills the soil with water. And then all summer long, the trees are sucking the water out of the soil. And if you get to the end of the summer, you know, August, September, um, and you, you've depleted the water in the soil, that's when it gets all crunchy underfoot when you're hiking. And that's when we have our fires, is when you run out of water by the end of the summer. And of course, if you had 10 degrees warmer climate, you're gonna run out of that water sooner. You, every day, you're sucking more water out of the soil. The other thing is that the season for evaporation gets longer, right? The spring comes earlier and the fall comes later, so your fire seasons expand on each end. And there's that many more days of evaporation to, to you know, use up the water that you have in the soil. And the third thing is, you know those really bad fire days where it's like, well, maybe not up here, but 99 degrees in the shade and 3% relative humidity and it's windy? and they have to evacuate the firefighters and it crosses the river and it burns the subdivisions and all that kind of stuff. Those kind of days happen way more often in a hot summer than they do in a cool summer. So for all three of these reasons, you get way more fire in a warmer climate. And this is actually a study came out um, some years ago from the National Research Council, shows that our mountains here in uh, central Colorado um, get something like 650% more wildfire and this is per degree Celsius of warming. So if you're gonna have five degrees Celsius, it's something like 3,000% increase in, in fire. In fact, much of our forest here in the high country um, is in a regime where if you, if you increase fire this much, the return time of the fire gets to be shorter than the time it takes to grow a tree. And in that case, you just don't grow trees, right? You, you, you switch to something like 
you know, cheatgrass and sagebrush and, and whatever, uh, and you can't su support a forest. Um, this is another bad myth that people have without thinking about it. The, the myth is, and it's actually quite dangerous for somebody like me to tell you things that aren't true. So, so be, beware, the, the thing about telling people myths is that they're gonna remember the myth, right? So, so I'm going to say something that's not true, okay? Get, get that through your head. The thing that's not true is that when we stop burning carbon, the CO2 will go away, okay? And everything go back to normal. And unfortunately, this is just not true. Like, you know how the brown cloud goes away in Denver, like on Saturday when there's not so much traffic? Um, that's because the, the air pollution is chemically reactive. Actually, that's why it's bad. Air pollution is bad for you because it reacts with your sinuses and your lungs and it hurts you. Um, but the, other, the good thing about having it be chemically reactive like that is when you stop putting it in the air, it just burns away. It, it, it reacts, turns into other stuff. CO2 is not like that. CO2 is chemically inert. Once it's up in the air, it doesn't go away. Um, eventually, it'll dissolve into the oceans, but it'll take thousands and thousands of years for it to dissolve into the oceans. And it does bad stuff to the ocean when it does that. So this is not a prediction. This is a what if. So these, these graphs go all the way back to the year 1800 and they go all the way up to the year 2300, and that's ridiculous. Nobody can predict what's gonna happen in the year 2300. Um, just for grins, the year 2300 is sort of somewhere between Captain Kirk and Jean-Luc Picard. Um, so so the, the red line here is emissions of CO2, and you are here, right? We're, we're burning something like 10 billion tons of carbon a year. And believe it or not, if China and India and Africa build modern economies based on fossil fuels, we will not just emit as much as we are today, but the, the amount of emissions in, uh, in this century will triple because there's billions of people in China and India and Africa want to set stuff on fire. The CO2 is shown by the blue line and the temperature is shown by the, the upper red line and you can see that, you know, I've made up a, a story here that in the year 2100, like happy new year, January 1st, 2100, we turn it off. We, we, you know, discover dilithium crystals or, you know, some kind of super duper energy source and you know, the fossil fuel emissions go to zero. But look what happens to CO2, almost nothing. It just stops going up. It doesn't come back down. And the temperature doesn't come back down either. It, it's, the, the extra CO2 will stay in the air for thousands and thousands of years. The extra, so a lot of that CO2 will still be in the air as much in the future from now as the beginning of agriculture was in the past. It, it's it's a, a problem for the millennia, not just a problem like for the next presidential election. It's kind of, it's kind of like you got a thermostat with a ratchet on it and you can turn it up, but you can't turn it back down. So th this is the serious part, and I, I know it's a bummer. I, I hate, you know, I, I see your faces when I say this stuff, and it's, it, it hurts me to do that to you. But, um, but now I'm gonna talk about good stuff. So we're gonna talk about solutions. We're gonna get to solutions. So this is a problem that gets worse and worse and worse, and then it doesn't get better, unless you fix it. And I'm gonna tell you that we can fix it. We know how to fix it. We can afford to fix it. In fact, we can't afford not to fix it. This guy, his name is Kaya. I can't remember his first name. He's a Japanese economist. Okay, there's some math here, but this is, it's easy math, okay? Uh, there's four things that determine how much CO2 we produce. It's population times the amount of money, GDP, economic activity per person, times the amount of energy it takes to make a buck, times the amount of CO2 you produce per unit energy, okay? And, and here's, here's the little math quiz. You can do the algebra, right? You can, the, the E cancels the E, the dollar sign cancels the dollar sign, the P cancels the P, and you get CO2 equals CO2. So, so you, you know it's true, right? Because it, it comes out. Um, this is called the Kaya identity. Now, uh, population is going up. The average person is getting richer. Um, in order for those two things to happen, um, these other two things, the amount of energy it takes to make a dollar and the amount of CO2 that we re release by uh, making energy have to go down. And there's really no other way to do it. Um, in fact, I'm gonna tell you, uh, 
we have to make CO2 emissions go to zero. You, we can argue about it afterwards, about how quickly we have to make it go to zero. You just heard uh, that, that Summit County is going to make your emissions go down 80% by 2050. Um, but even if you want to go 80% by 2050, how are you going to do that? You're going to kill 80% of the people? Pro probably not okay, right? That, that's really not a solution. Um, are you going to take away 80% of everybody's income? Again, not, not real popular. So really, it's just those last two numbers got to go to zero in order that these other two numbers don't go to zero. That, that's how this works. And there's, there's really precious little wiggle room in, in that number. You, you guys, many of you are kind of my age. Not, not all of you, that's, that's good. Um, back when I was a kid, uh, the population was growing very fast. And in fact, uh, the population of the world has more than doubled in my lifetime. And it will never double again. Now that's something that you may not have internalized, but, but the world has changed dramatically since I was a kid. The population rate of growth is this red line. The rate of growth of po world population is half what it was when I was in high school. And it's expected to go to zero by the end of this century. Population growth has really slowed down and it is expected by demographers and so forth to, to eventually reach zero. But the people that are already here are making more and more money, and that's good. Okay, there's, there's seven and a half billion people on Earth. I should probably tell you about this picture. These are two pictures taken from the same spot, 20 years apart. So well, the first picture was taken in 1991, and the second picture was taken in 2012 from the same spot in Shanghai. You can see this clock tower in the front, right? It's still there. Uh, I walked this neighborhood in Shanghai a few years ago. Shanghai is amazing. Uh, more people live in the city proper in Shanghai than any other city on earth. 22 million people in, in the city, so three times the size of New York City. Uh, but it's completely surrounded by suburbs. Every one of those suburbs has more than 10 million people, and you've never heard about one of them. Shanghai metro area has more than 75 million people li living in, in essentially the city of Shanghai. And what you're seeing here in this picture is not population growth but economic growth. Shanghai went from 20 years ago being a, a third world city to being like the capital of the world. It's amazing with like bullet trains and fancy restaurants and stock exchanges and people in fancy clothes and all this kind of stuff. And, and that's kind of the story, been the story of China for 20 years is this amazing explosive uh, economic growth. Their population has not appreciably grown in 20 years, but their economy is, is you know, five times the size it was 20 years ago. Amazing. And what that means is that billions and billions of people are coming out of dire poverty. There are, there are seven and a half billion people in the world, but only one billion people like us. Okay, people like us, I mean people who use a lot of energy. And by the end of this century, there's only gonna be a little more people in the world, but there's gonna be four times as many people like us because of economic growth. So the, the population growth in, in the 21st century may be 30%, but the energy use is going to increase by 300%. It's 10 times the rate of population growth. This is that second number in the, in the Kaya formula. So in order to accommodate billions of people moving into the modern world and joining the party and having you know, decent lives, I mean, there's like 2.5 billion people who have no electricity. There's 2 billion people who have no toilets. It, it's terrible. And, and those people, we have to accommodate the idea that they can live decent lives, but we can't have them do that by setting stuff on fire. Okay, so some good news now. Regarding energy per dollar, how much does it take to make a buck? Turns out, perhaps surprising to many of you, that our biggest carbon footprint is not our cars, it's our buildings. In the developed world, about half of the energy we use is, is used either to construct buildings or to operate buildings. So think heating and lighting and air conditioning, actually think mining the ore and smelting the steel and you know, cutting the trees and all that kind of stuff, moving stuff around. About 46% of our energy usage in the United States is from buildings. 
And these are some pro projections that were made by the US Department of Energy. So that brown line at the top uh, was projection made back in the early part of this century out to 2030. They thought the energy use in US buildings was just gonna keep increasing like crazy. Uh, they made the same projection in 07, in 09, 11. And so you can see what's happened here is this amazing reduction in our expected energy use in buildings. In fact, it's basically flatlined now. And it's not because we're all shivering in the dark. It's because people got smarter about how to build and operate buildings. Um, there's a movement called Architecture 2030. You should look this up. It's amazing. This guy, Ed Masria, who's a famous architect, put together, a, it's kind of like a petition, but it's, it's better than that. It's a movement. And every major commercial architecture firm in the world has signed up to this pledge. And the pledge says that by the year 2030, every major commercial architect in the world will not build, not design any buildings that are not net zero energy by, by 2030. All buildings built after 2030 will not use any energy over the life cycle of the building. They'll put back as much on the grid as they take off to construct the building. Amazing. Um, and, and that is not making us go broke, that, that's helping people in the construction industry to, to, to build buildings, amazing. Just that saving alone in the United States alone will save us four and a half trillion dollars by 2030 because of energy that we used to waste that we don't have to waste anymore. This is a no brainer, it, it, it's, it's something that costs negative dollars. We, we do this and there's more money in your pocket when you do it than if you don't do it. it it's just so, uh, much of a win-win. And the idea is to take the savings that you do from energy efficiency and plow those into energy generation. So let's talk about energy generation. These, these graphs are hard to read. Uh, similar kind of projections. These are international projections. Each line projects out how much new solar they expected and how much new wind they expected all the way out to 2025. And the, the, the early projections are at the bottom, right? So there's a projection made in 2006 was that there's going to be whatever that is, five gigawatts of new solar and uh, 20 gigawatts of new wind by, by 2025. And they made the same, project, the same kind of projection in 08, 09, 10, 11, 12. See what they've done every year. They basically take what this year's new solar and just flatline it out. What? Like, what are these people smoking? The, the actual new solar is this black dash line and the actual new wind is that black dash line. So, so what's really happened is that the growth in renewable energy ha has not just outpaced projections, but it's outpaced them by, by like factors of 20. It's amazing how much quicker this transition has happened than anybody expected 10 years ago. And the reason is because it's gotten dirt cheap. This is the price for solar panels since I graduated high school. The year I, gradu I graduated high school in 1977, and solar panels cost $77 a watt in 1977, and now they cost less than 30 cents a watt. Solar panels are 200 times cheaper than when I was in high school. I mean, I, I remember being in high school. It, it doesn't even feel like that long ago to me, and, and imagine if other stuff was 200 times cheaper than when I was in high school, right? What, what if cars were 200 times cheaper than when I was in high school? It's, it's amazing that this has happened. And it's happened not just in solar panels, but in many aspects of the energy economy. These, these phenomenal transitional costs. Um, this is how much sun falls in a year in the US and Germany. Germany went from 4% wind and solar on their electric grid in the year 2000 to 32% wind and solar on their grid in 2016. Germany gets less sun than Alaska. It, imagine if we did this here. Holy shit, mama, there's just an amazing amount of, snow, of sun down, down there in the, like the San Luis Valley or, or Arizona. I mean, you got to do something with it, right? You got to like have, have wires or something to connect it to LA or New Jersey. But wowza, there's an awful lot of, of potential resource that we have just dwarfs what they have in Europe. And, and yet the Europeans have, have gone for this, this tremendous energy transition. Um, now, you know, what do you do when the sun's on? I notice it's not sunny this afternoon out here. Um, you gotta have storage or transmission. Um, these are battery costs 
This one only goes back to 2010. The price of batteries has fallen almost 90% since 2010. Oh, amazing, factor of 10, less than it was in 2010. And that's expected to continue. In fact, uh, I read someplace that lithium ion batteries are supposed to fall by a third in 2019, amazing. So this is happening in many, many industries. Um, yeah, well, you, you see what I'm, what I'm, where I'm going here, the, the, you know, the gigafactory in, uh, in Nevada, and there's a new one being built in Buffalo, New York. Um, Colorado last year, um, Xcel Energy decided to retire two giant coal fire power plants in Pueblo. Uh, together, they, they uh, I think it's about 600 megawatts of electricity. And they went on the open market for bids for, to replace the juice from these two aging coal fire power plants. And they got hundreds of bids, um, but just the wind plus storage came out to two cents a kilowatt hour. The average bid for wind plus storage came out two cents. A, I, well, I don't know what your electricity costs here. My, my electricity in Fort Collins is about 11 cents a kilowatt hour. So two cents a kilowatt hour is, is shockingly low. It's less than half of what it was costing Excel to operate the coal fire power plants that they already bought and paid for, right? So, so actually dismantling perfectly good coal plants saves them 50% of their cost. Amazing, and this is not some pie in the sky future. This is 2018 here in Colorado. Amazing. It's gonna cost some money. Yes, there's a toilet on this slide. It is not a suggestion. I, I promise I will finish soon. Uh, economists study you know, the climate transition, the energy transition. They estimate that the total cost to the world of replacing all of that fossil fuel infrastructure with uh, renewable electricity, transmission lines, storage, the whole, the whole nine yards, is, will cost about 1% of all the money in the world. Okay, now that's a lot. Um, you probably have never thought about this, but, but anybody wanna guess? What, what is the total global gross domestic product? Uh, the, the total value of all the goods and services sold in the world in a year, any idea? 50 trillion. Uh, great, great guess. So uh, about 80 trillion, a 80 trillion dollars a year is the, is the total cost of all the goods and services produced in a year. 1% of that is $800 billion a year. Okay, that's more than the US defense budget. That, that is a lot of money. 1% of the global economy is about what our ancestors paid to retrofit all the world's cities with indoor plumbing 100 years ago. Think of the cost, if you had to do it today, of digging up every street in New York and Paris and London and Tokyo and laying sewer pipes, and then knocking out tenement walls 20 stories tall and putting in you know, hot and cold running water, and then knocking out all the internal partitions and putting in toilets and sinks and showers. Imagine what that would cost. And boy, was that worth it. You know, Would you rather that the world had a 1% bigger economy and you still had to poop in the street? Never mind what it did for your, for your bowels. What, what did it do for plumbers? What did it do for plumbing suppliers? What did it do for the grocery store down the street from the plumber? What did it do for the children of that plumber who could then go to college? I mean, when, when people spend big, big money on infrastructure like that, it's not like the whole world goes broke. It, it actually is a, uh, a way to stimulate the economy. In fact, it was a huge stimulus to the economy in the early 20th century was, was putting it indoor plumbing. These are my grandparents, that's Max and that's Francis. And it wasn't them personally that did all that indoor plumbing, but it was their generation. And when they were done with indoor plumbing, they moved on to rural electrification. Think, think of the cost of stringing separate little copper wires to every house in Nebraska and Kansas. Oh my gosh. You know, we'll all go broke, but we didn't. And when they were done with, you know, like rural electrification, they went off and fought the Nazis. I mean, these guys were no slouches. These are my parents, that's Margie and that's Bob. And their generation in the 50s and 60s picked up the torch and, and they, did, uh, they did the Cold War, they did interstate highways, all of these things were like 1% of the world economy. They, they sent people to the moon, amazing, and brought them back. They, they spent giant, giant money on all these projects, and, and that did not cause the world to go broke in the 1960s. This is me back when I had hair, and my wife, Jennifer, in our generation, 
We, we, not me personally, we put billions of computers on office desks all over the world, you know, at three or $4,000 a pop, billions of them. It, it's amazing. That's trillions and trillions of dollars that my generation spent on building and, and, and deploying computers. Imagine the cost. It just dwarfs the kind of money we've been talking about. And did our world go completely belly up because we built a whole bunch of computers? No. And when we were done with that, we did you know, mobile phones and the internet. All of those are 1% of the world economy kind of projects. And, and that's not, not only did that not crash the economy, this, this was the economy during my lifetime, right? My, my adulthood was, was essentially generated almost all the employment in the world by doing these giant infrastructure projects. And these are my kids, that's Matt and that's Nate, and they get to do it again. They get to replace a perfectly usable but aging set of energy infrastructure with infrastructure that doesn't destroy the freaking world. And, and that's gonna generate all of the economic growth and all of the employment in their lifetimes. That's how it works. Since the 1500s, our civilization has done this over and over and over. We constantly do it, it's what makes us the modern world. If, if you wanna go back to living in the Middle Ages, okay, but the rest of us probably don't wanna do that. You get to pick your, your vision of history. I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer you a choice. There is a reasonably coherent story that people tell, and you can understand the logic of it. It kind of hangs together. It's, it's a good story, and everybody knows this story. The story is that our well-being comes from stuff we dig out of the ground, okay? That, that there's value in a lump of coal, and somebody sells that coal for a profit to somebody who sets it on fire, and they sell the energy for a profit to somebody that uses that energy to make goods and services, and they sell it to the profit. Before you know it, you got an 80 trillion dollar a year global economy. And maybe that is the way history works, but God, I hope not. Because if that's really the way it works, then when you either run out of coal or decide to stop burning it, you shiver in the dark. Your kids are doomed to, you know, trying to feed a world of nine billion people on, on medieval technology. What a horrible, dark, grim view of history. I don't want to live in that world. I prefer this one, where we make our world through creativity and ingenuity and hard work, not from the ground, but from the sweat of our brows and the sparks in our souls. And we're not running out of those things, and the kids are going to be all right. Thank you. So you can get the slides. Um, my website is called simpleserioussolvable.org, and the slides are all downloadable. And I think uh, Summit TV is taping this, and you can tell your friends to watch it on TV. It'll be on YouTube. On YouTube. Yeah, on TV10. Um, yes, and Scott has the slides on his website. We'll post them on our website.